So I decided uh, last night, what the hell? Why not give NXT a shot? So I decided to watch NXT TakeOver Unstoppable. And, you know, I'm somewhat glad that I did. I don't think it's the best NXT special event that I've watched, that's for sure. Uh, but it's better than a lot of WWE pay-per-views that I've seen, that's also for sure. Now, part of it is true that it helps that I don't watch NXT each and every single week, so I have a little bit of a fresher perspective. I'm watching it from a different standpoint than as to what I would, let's say, a WWE pay-per-view after watching Raw every single week. You know, I'm not as plugged into the storylines, so I can look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. Also, because the show is shorter, it's easier to get through. It's two hours. God, isn't that nice? I thought the show was relatively well-paced. I liked how most everything had at least some type of purpose for why I was actually on the show. And then we got a nice finish with a nice surprise debut uh, that sent the people home, I think, ultimately happy. So I have to say that I enjoyed NXT TakeOver Unstoppable. Again, not the best NXT special I've watched, that's for sure. I've seen several, I think, that have been better. But... You know, if this is kind of the low bar in terms of what NXT can deliver, then that's a good sign for me about the direction for this developmental territory uh, going forward. And, you know, makes me start to think that I should be watching this product on a more consistent basis. Whenever I do choose to watch NXT, one of the things I'm always looking at is I'm looking at the performers, the type of characters that they have, how those characters are clicking at the NXT level, how those characters might relate or translate to the bigger level, how ready these individuals are or are not for the main stage. Do they have that type of potential? What is their potential? These are all different things I'm looking at. Uh, one thing that was interesting to me is at one point in time, they made it a point to point out some of the newest signings uh, to NXT. And the last one, of course, was UHA Nation. And you'll notice the crowd responded relatively kindly when they saw UHA. I'm just saying WWE... Uh, your fans are more ready for a black champion than you probably are. And maybe you should take note of that reaction and see this guy and be like, hey, you know, maybe we should give a shit with this guy. And maybe we should avoid some of the pitfalls that we fall into with our black wrestlers primarily on a consistent basis because it seems like the people like this guy. I'm just saying, I, I know, I'm i sure other people noticed it too, but I thought it was interesting. It was kind of like an F.U. Uh, to Triple H and Stephanie and Vince and saying, you know, hey, uh, the, the fans like this guy. Do well by this guy, damn it. The actual show kicked off with a number one contenders match between Tyler Breeze and Finn Balor. And I got to say, for both of these guys, their entrances are top notch. They have really, really damn good, intricate, interesting entrances that I think would translate to the main roster level. And a lot of times, you know, when that music hits and you make that entrance, that's sometimes in today's business the most important thing. You know, people pop for the music sometimes and the entrance more than the actual performer itself. So if you can captivate people right away and you can grab their attention immediately and make an impression from the get-go, you have a much better chance of getting over the way it really matters where it really matters. And it most certainly helps that Breeze and Balor have two of the best entrances in NXT and, frankly, probably in all of WWE right now. However, I also look to see how those characters are incorporated once the matches actually are underway. And once you get past Tyler Breeze's entrance and once you get past Vin, Finn Balor's entrance, I don't really see where their characters are matching what they do in the ring. And I know I'm sure a lot of you really liked Breeze and Balor, but I thought this was just a mediocre average match. This was most certainly nothing special and didn't make me really feel like this was for a title shot um, against either a Kevin Owens down the road or Sami Zayn or what have you. It just didn't feel like that. And I think part of it was is once you got past the pomp and the circumstance of both of these guys and their great entrances, especially Finn Balor, and he got to the meat and potatoes of the actual match, there just wasn't a lot there. There's a lot of sizzle at the beginning, but there's not much steak. If I'm just being perfectly honest, and again, looking at this from fresh eyeballs, that's the way I see it. You know, so I have concerns about both guys and how they would translate to the main roster because once you got past their entrances, then what the hell did they bring to the table? 
And now look at Finn Balor. Maybe this match wasn't the best showcase for him, and that could be true. I'm not somebody that's followed him for years uh, on the independent scene as Prince Devitt or anything like that. But after the entrance and the body paint, I frankly just don't see what all the fuss is about. I really don't. I don't think this match was a very good showcase for him, even though he ended up winning. So there was a women's tag afterwards, and I have to say, I'm looking at Bailey and Charlotte on the one hand, and I can see where they have main roster poten potential. Charlotte as being kind of that athletic alpha female type, which would kind of make some sense, especially with her family lineage, what have you. I could see where Bailey has that type of, you know, girl next door type of appeal, let's hug it out, you know, kind of cute in her own way. I get that. The other side, Emma, that was a Dana Brooks is the other one. I don't see where either one of them, frankly, just me looking at it again with fresh eyeballs, I don't see where either one of them had much in the way of uh, main roster potential. Furthermore, this match wasn't all that particularly good. It really, really wasn't. I think it's fascinating. I'm kind of starting to wonder, is the roster of women in NXT about as big as the roster of divas at WWE? That kind of surprises me, and I don't really get it. It's almost like they have too many women on NXT, if that's possible. Yeah, this was a match that you can probably skip through. You had, frankly, the way I saw it, the way I saw it anyways, was you had one side had all the talent, and the other side did not. I'm a firm believer in sports that oftentimes the only way you're going to get better is to go against those that are better than you. And sometimes you have to learn how to lose before you learn how to win. And I think in wrestling especially this holds true. The only way you're going to get better is not to go against people of similar talents and abilities at the same level as you, but to go against people that are more experienced, that are better, that understand where they've been and where you're trying to get to. So I'm all for individuals like Rhino being a part of the NXT roster on a full-time basis. I think there are more guys from the WWE main roster that should be a part of NXT because, again, they've been to the big dance. They understand what it takes to get there. They are better, whether you want to accept it or not, than most of the people working on the NXT level, especially from a WWE standpoint. So putting Rhino against somebody like a Baron Corbin makes a world of sense. Obviously, this company sees something in Baron Corbin. I see a guy with size, with a decent look, and a pretty good finisher. And that's about it. So it makes a lot of sense to have somebody like a Rhino work with him to try and help get more out of him, to teach him how to do things so that way he will have at some point more than just size, a look, and an awesome finisher. I'm not going to expect much out of a match between Rhino and Baron Corbin, and nor has Rhino ever really been one of my guys or anything like that. This pretty much was what it was. At least they didn't have Corbin completely smash Rhino, uh, but they did have him win, and that's fine. You know, in terms of Corbin, I can see where some of the fuss is made, but this guy is nowhere near ready for prime time and needs a lot of work. So we had three title matches on TakeOver Unstoppable, the first of which was a tag title match. You've got Blake and Murphy defending against uh, Colin Cassidy and Enzo Amore, and it's clear to see who the fan favorites are. It's clear to see who the stars of the show are in terms of Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy, and you throw on Carmella too. I love the shtick that they come out with at the beginning. You know, Enzo Amore, I don't think he's much in the ring and, you know, you look at the lack of size and, you know, I would question what his role is going to be on the main roster at some point. But hopefully they can find a role for him because the man has personality. He has charisma. He has the ability to interest you with his mouthpiece. And that is something that is vastly lacking in the WWE. So hopefully when the time comes, I hope they do bring all three of them up as a unit together because I think it could work well. Work as well as it has at the NXT level? I don't know. Because again, the NXT level, they've been able to do it and ply it for a long period of time. And, you know, that means something. They've had stability and consistency in terms of what's been done with the characters and opportunity that they usually won't be afforded once they get up to Raw or SmackDown. Uh, but the tag title match was solid. You know, I think Amore has gotten at least a little bit better in the ring. Not bad for somebody that came to them with really no ring experience whatsoever. You know, does a good job as kind of that designated heat getter. You know, Cassidy, I look at him, another really big dude. Um, 
He's got some of it, but it's still not there. You know, sometimes it just takes longer to get it out of these guys, and sometimes they just frankly don't have it. I thought it was very interesting, though, and this is what made this match really work for me because it was solid but not spectacular. It was the finish. The crowd really wanted Cassidy and Amore to win those tag titles, and they were legitimately pissed when they didn't. Like, it's hard sometimes when you get these hardcore fan groups like you do with an NXT to get real legitimate heel heat. It's a hard audience to be able to get that with. And when you can get it, and when you can actually piss these people off, and not doing it because they bring in some type of wrestler like a big show or something they want to poon on, nothing like that, but like legitimately earn it where you've legitimately pissed people off, that's something. They accomplished something with this match. Because I found myself disappointed that these two guys didn't fucking win the tag titles. I thought the decision personally was S-A-W-F-T SOFT! You know, it's a shame that WWE, when it comes to their main shows, forgets that women could be an integral part of the show. They could be a money draw. They can be a ratings draw. This is something that is a historically documented fact. So it's been very disappointing over the years to see the WWE always kind of go back to the old school kind of Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn type of these bitches really don't matter type of theory or philosophy because it's a very closed-minded way to think. And frankly, it's a bad way to think from a business standpoint. It just is. Now you look at this women's title match between Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks and you understand just how outdated and um, ridiculous that philosophy that they have at the big level is. I mean, this was clearly the match of the night. I, I think most people agree with this. This is probably, even if people didn't really like the show, this is the one match that people will keep coming back to. I bet in some way, some people, WWE NXT fans, will talk about this as a top 10 match for 2015. I might get that sense. I'm not sure. I might be overrating it just a little bit. But this match was outstanding. You take two women, you give them reason and purpose and a story for having a match, then you give them plenty of time to execute that story within the match. You have these two characters do what these two characters are supposed to do within the confines of that match. And then you have kind of the cool heel go over in a pretty legitimate way. And the people are really happy. And the people are buzzing about this match. You don't think that this is something that you could use at the main roster level? Like the way I look at it right now, Sasha Banks is ready for the main roster. Whether she's ratchet or not, it don't matter, baby. Becky Lynch saw, showed me something. To me, it looked like she had improved a lot over the past few months. She's not quite ready for prime time just yet, but I think Sasha Banks most certainly is. But man, this was a really good women's title match. And in some ways... Um, if you didn't have the way the main event actually finished, I almost wish that this women's title match would have actually main evented the show. And based off of the quality of the performances that we get out of some of these NXT women's matches, I hope that's a nice statement that at some point in time uh, Triple H will make by allowing the women to actually main event one of these NXT shows because if they continue to deliver like this, they will most certainly have earned that designation, that's for sure. And I think if you're looking at it from a Triple H perspective, you got to feel pretty confident that somebody like a Sasha Banks as your NXT champion at this point in time could deliver a match, main event quality, for one of your important NXT shows and send the people home happy. Well, I'm sure that some of you are disappointed yet ecstatic about the main event of TakeOver Unstoppable. Well, I'm sure that's what it is. You're disappointed that Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn didn't go 20-plus minutes and have that type of classic match that you've expected out of them after all of these years. Well, you know what, frankly, I've seen enough Steen Generico over the years, if we're being honest. I don't really need to see it anymore. Furthermore, with Sami Zayn's injury, uh, it makes sense to try and protect him. You went ahead with the match, but you did it in a certain way. And it also fits with Kevin Owens and what you're trying to do with him at the particular moment. You're trying to get him ready for Cena at Elimination Chamber. Why not fucking wipe out Sami Zayn? Yeah, they've done it before with Zayn. Well, why can't they do it again? And especially when it comes from a Kevin Owens and the way that Kevin Owens does it, it makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to this show... Ultimately, outside of maybe that outstanding women's title match, what will be remembered about this is the debut of Samoa Joe. Kevin Owens better be careful because Joe's going to kill you. You know, I wasn't sure that this was ever going to happen. I wasn't sure, frankly, that the WWE was ever going to make it happen. And I'm not sure they ever needed to make it happen. But it's happened. And I'm happy it's happened. 
I'm happy that Joe is going to get this opportunity. From what I've seen, it doesn't sound like it's a main roster type of deal at this point. They're going to allow Joe to work independent dates, which I find very interesting. And hopefully that's a way for them to bring in some other guys uh, from around the world that could come in and work with some of their uh, newer faces and help make them better. And I I'm interested to see how this works. One thing I do applaud WWE for, at least at the moment, is they're going with Samoa Joe. And what I mean is they're actually going with the Samoa Joe name. No coming in and calling him Scuba Steve or Swimming Sin, nothing like that. You're letting him be Samoa Joe. You're calling him Samoa Joe. You're already hopping on the bandwagon by selling Samoa Joe merchandise. And I hope his merchandise sells relatively well because if TNA goes away, I'd like to see a few of those guys be able to get some opportunities at NXT. And if Joe does well, this is a very important test run for some of those other guys. Let's be honest. It really is. And if Joe in particular does really, really well, maybe some of these guys that come from other places can be able to have enough negotiating power in terms of the power of their name to be able to keep their name. So that way you're not changing Brian Daniels into Daniel Bryan, if you get what I mean. You know, we get frustrated when we see these name changes like Kevin Owens could have just said Kevin Steen. It just, it's nice, and I was happy to see that. In terms of the stare down between... Uh, Owens and Joe. As soon as Joe's uh, somewhat crappy music hit, and I saw Joe walk out, I'm like, oh shit, this is instantly cool. And I look at Kevin Owens, I'm like, this is really fucking cool. And then they have the face down, and I know a lot of people that were there were kind of disappointed, or this is a bummer, because these guys didn't go to blows, you know. They shouldn't go to blows. Just because you can and would work doesn't mean that you should, or that it needed to, or that it would work as well as it should. You know, as much as we get on the WWE for hot-shotting things and as much as they do rush things, sometimes it's okay to let things simmer. It's okay to wait it out a little bit. I can't wait to see where they go next with Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe. This has actually got me now to the point where, at least for the moment, I'll actually be watching NXT each and every single week, which means, luckily for you that want me to, I will be reviewing NXT each and every single week. How long will that carry on for? I don't really know. But this show did that for me. I was looking for something as a wrestling fan. And while, like I said, this wasn't the best NXT special event that I've seen, uh, it's a lot better than a lot of the recent main WWE pay-per-views that I've seen, but it did enough. NXT's got enough combinations of a few different things to at least pique my interest a little bit. You know, with looking at some of the talents that are there, some of the talents like Yuha Nisha that are on the horizon, uh, a newly debuting Samoa Joe, you know, they piqued my interest. So if that's what WWE was trying to do with this during their free month of the network, then I have to say, <laughs> at least someone, mission accomplished. <laughs>